Hello there, this is Glenn Berry with Dr. DMV LLC, and I'm back with another video. Here's what the inside of the machine looks like with the right side panel taken off, and we'll have a lot more detail about those interior components later. Here's what the front of it looks like. It's sort of a carbon fiber look, and you've got a lot of USB ports, an SD card reader, and also an audio port at the top. And then this side panel does not come off. Here's what the back of the unit looks like. You've got a 92 millimeter cooling fan at the top, and then you've got a really nice power supply at the bottom. It's a 400 watt, 80 plus platinum unit. And you can see the USB ports in the middle there and a one gig network port. And then at the top is the audio ports. And you could drive three monitors off of this included discrete video card. So you've got DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort. Let's take a look at some quick benchmark results for the stock machine as a baseline. Here's the CPU-Z on the stock unit straight out of the box. We have an AMD Ryzen 5 3500 processor. This is a Zen 2 7 nanometer Matisse CPU that's only normally available to OEMs. This CPU has a base clock of 3.4 GHz and a max boost clock of 4.1 GHz. It has six cores and six threads, so no symmetrical multi-threading. It has a 65 watt TDP rating, and that affects the cooling that you need for this unit. This particular SKU only has a 16 megabyte L3 cache compared to a 32 megabyte L3 cache in a Ryzen 5 3600 CPU. Looking at the memory tab in CPU-Z, we have one stick of DDR4 3200CL22 RAM that's actually running at 1596.8 MHz. That means that XMP is enabled. That's very unusual for an OEM machine, and it's running in single channel mode since we only have one DIMM. That is a common, bad configuration that you often see in OEM machines. Luckily, it is easy to fix by adding a second DIMM. Next, we have the CPU-Z benchmark results. We have a single thread score of 498 and a multi-thread score of 2915.6. This makes it slightly better than a four core eight thread Intel Core i7-7700K CPU from several years ago. This is enough CPU performance for an entry-level gaming machine in 2021. On Geekbench 5.4, we get a single core score of 1146, which is pretty decent. Anything above 1000 is usually good enough for gaming and most normal usage, although higher is always better. The multi-core score is only 3998 in the stock configuration. The multi-core score is really hurt by the RAM running in single channel mode. In ADA64, the memory bandwidth scores on the top row are also hurt a lot by being in single channel mode. You can also see more detail about the CPU and memory speeds and configurations in ADA64. In Cinebench R20, we get a score of 2614, which is slightly better than the score of 2420 for an Intel Core i7-7700K CPU. That makes some sense since the Ryzen 5 3500 has six cores and six threads, while the Intel Core i7-7700K has four cores and eight threads. The OEM NVIDIA GTX 1650 Super has a CUDA score of 57575 in Geekbench. That gives you a rough idea of how powerful that GPU is. We will compare that to an NVIDIA GTX 1660 Ti a little bit later. Finally, we have Crystal Dismark scores. This is a 256 gigabyte Kioxia XG6 M.2 PCIe 3.0 X4 NVMe SSD. It is pretty unusual to have M.2 NVMe drives in entry-level OEM machines, so that's a good sign. On the negative side, 256 gigabytes is quite small, which limits your drive space and also hurts your performance compared to larger capacity drives from the same product family. Even so, these scores are much better than any SATA SSD. Crystal Disk Info uncovers a potentially serious performance bottleneck. Do you see it? The 256 gigabyte Kioxia XG6 M.2 drive is actually an X4 device, which means it can use four PCIe 3.0 lanes. This would give it a sequential bandwidth limit of about 3600 megabytes per second. Crystal Disk Info shows that it's only an X2 mode, which cuts the sequential bandwidth limit in half. 
This could be a big issue for some use cases, but I don't think it's a big deal here. Why is that? Well, first, this is a gaming machine. Storage performance has very little effect on gaming performance. Things like game startup time and loading new levels of games are not affected very much when you go from a decent SATA SSD, so even a very high-end PCIe 4.0 NVMe SSD. There have been many extensive benchmarks showing this on many different games. Second, you only have the one M.2 NVMe SSD in the system. Even if you add one or two SATA SSDs, you won't have any way to move or copy files from one drive to another that will saturate a PCIe 3.0 X2 link. The Gigabit Ethernet port can't do it either, and there's not any available PCIe slots for something like a real high-end PCIe storage card. The nerd in me doesn't like seeing that PCIe 3.0 X2 limit, but practically speaking, you probably won't notice it at all. After removing one screw, you can take off this black bracket so you can take apart the rest of the system. Moving around to the front, this shows you the Wi-Fi antenna that you can see after you pop off the plastic front panel. And you have to pop that off because you're going to have to remove a screw that you'll see in the center of that front panel in just a second. But this shows you the Wi-Fi antenna that connects to a little M.2 card on the motherboard. So here's what it looks like where that screw is that you have to remove. So you have to take that off, and then once you do that, you'll be able to take off the hard drive cage that was inside. And this is the stock RAM, and it's not very fancy. It's just a green PCB. It's a DDR3200 CL22 RAM. And then you can see the stock power supply and the stock video card. And I've already replaced the RAM. I took out the original RAM and put in two sticks of G-Skill DDR3200 CL16, so slightly higher specification memory. That's the stock CPU cooler that you're going to be stuck with. There's no easy re way to replace that. This is running Cinebench R20 on the system after upgrading the RAM. I was a little surprised that the RAM speed fell back to the stock JDEX speed, and there's no setting in the BIOS for re-enabling XMP, so I'm interested in what's going to happen with this benchmark run. And you can see this is a tile-based renderer, and more cores help performance here. So the more cores, the better. You only have six cores on this system, so it's taking a little bit of time to render this picture. But once it finishes up, we'll see what the score is with two sticks of RAM and being in dual-channel memory mode, which should help a little bit. And you can see here the score jumped up to 2711, which is a little bit of an increase, but it's not huge on this particular benchmark. And then we're going to take a look at the Heaven benchmark next. And that shows you one measurement of your GPU performance. And this is the stock uh, GTX 1650 Super. And then here's a look at the power supply and its specs. This is a look at the stock OEM GTX 1650 video card. And it's pretty short and it's not very long either. And that's important because this is a pretty small case. That beer can gives you a sense of the scale of the size of the case and the card. And then here's our three different video cards. The one on the bottom right is that stock OEM card. And to the left of it is another 1650 Super that has a better heat sink. And then above it, is a 1660 Super with two fans that's much longer. And the length isn't an issue here, it's the height. That card is just too tall to fit in this case. The next thing I did was replace the stock SSD with a 500 gigabyte Samsung 970 Evo. And having more space is a big advantage here. You're still limited to X2 speeds. Here's the stock parts that we've already removed from the system. On the top is the M.2 drive, and the bottom is the stock memory stick. And those are just standard OEM parts. They're not very good looking, but it doesn't matter. There's no glass side panel here. And then here is the stock AMD Ryzen 5 3500 CPU after you take off the CPU cooler. And the CPU cooler is very easy to remove, just four screws, hold it down. Here's a comparison of the stock cooler on the left and you can see it's a pretty thick heat sink right there. And on the right is an AMD Wraith Stealth, the lowest end stock CPU cooler that AMD sells. So it's actually a pretty decent cooler that comes with this system. So here's what the bottom of the two coolers look like. So you have a square 
contact patch there for the AMD cooler. And this HP cooler has a round uh, contact patch there. And there's no copper here. It's all aluminum on both of them. And then here is the replacement CPU. So AMD Ryzen 5 3600X that I had laying around. I wanted to see if this 95 watt TDP CPU would work. This is an error message I saw when I first booted after replacing the CPU. Trusted Platform Manager or TPM is enabled from the factory on this unit. So if you swap out the CPU, you'll get a warning like this. You can hit Y to clear out the old TPM info. So once I did that, it booted up just fine. And after I did that, I ran Cinebench R20 with the new processor. So it's a Ryzen 5 3600X. That's a six core, 12 thread processor. And you can see it's rendering quite a bit faster than it was with the stock processor. But the end score is actually not going to jump that much because all you're really getting is the additional symmetrical multi-threading. You're not getting any real cores, but you do have a slightly faster clock speed on this. So as it, when it finishes up, the old score was 2711. So let's see what the new score ends up being. And... Again, this is a tile-based render, so more cores is better, and then faster single-thread performance also helps. So now it's going to finish in just a second here, and we'll see what the final score is. turns out to be, it looks like, uh, 3602. So that's a pretty decent jump from 2711. So next we'll take a look at an upgraded GPU. I found a 1660Ti card that was short enough that it would fit in this case. The length is not an issue, it's the height of the card you've got to be careful about. So that fit in here, and you've got an 8-pin connector from the power supply, so that worked with the 1660 Ti. And there's the stock parts that I've taken out of the system so far. We've replaced the memory and the storage, the GPU and the CPU. And here's another look at the fully assembled system. I also added a one terabyte Samsung 850 Pro SATA drive that I had lying around just to make sure that it would work and how it would perform with the rest of the system. So that's all been pretty easy upgrades to this system. Here's what the fully assembled system looks like with a side panel taken off. That black bracket is replaced and that's what it would look like right before you button up the system. And of course, you don't want to boot the system before you button it up because that's bad luck. So now I decided to install Folding at Home on this system and let it rip for a little while. And this is a really intense torture test for any system. And you can see here that it took the CPU temperature up to 89 degrees uh, Celsius, which is really too hot. And that's because of this small case that's not extremely well ventilated. It doesn't have any inlet fans. It has those holes you can see on the side panel right there for inlet. And it has a 92 millimeter exhaust fan at the top. And then the power supply has an exhaust fan. But it really just doesn't have enough ventilation. So running this folding at home with your GPU and CPU is basically going to cook this little system. And if you insist on doing this, it's going to shorten the life of the system. But you could take the side panel off and point a box fan at it, and that would help cool it down a little bit. But I just don't recommend that for this particular system. Let's take a look at some benchmark results for the fully modified machine. Here's what Windows Task Manager looks like. We have an AMD Ryzen 5 3600X processor. This 7 nanometer Zen 2 Matisse CPU has a base clock of 3.8 gigahertz and a max boost clock of 4.4 gigahertz. It has six cores and 12 threads. It also has a 95 watt TDP and a 32 megabyte L3 cache. Here are the CPU Z benchmark results. We have a single thread score of 510.4 and a multi thread score of 4150.1. The stock CPU had a single thread score of 498 and a multi thread score of 2915.6. For gaming, you won't notice a difference between these two CPUs. Upgrading the CPU will not help your gaming performance, but it will help performance for productivity applications. On Geekbench 5.4, we get a single core score of 1264 and a multi-core score of 6848. 
The stock CPU had a single core score of just 1146 and a multi-core score of 3998. Remember the stock configuration only had one stick of RAM, so it was in single channel mode, which really hurt it there. In ADA64, we see a significant improvement in the memory bandwidth scores, as you would expect in dual channel mode. The upgraded GTX 1660 Ti has a CUDA score of 70,186 in Geekbench. The OEM GTX 1650 Super had a CUDA score of 57,575. In the Heaven benchmark, the GTX 1660 Ti has an FPS score of 159.5 and an overall score of 4,017. The OEM GTX 1650 Super had an FES score of 113.3 and an overall score of 2853. In Crystal Dismark, there was no meaningful difference because of the X2 limit from the motherboard. The only reason to upgrade from the stock M.2 drive is to get more drive space. So what is my verdict on this OEM machine? Overall, I think it's a great value for 1080p gaming, even in its stock configuration. You are getting $800 to $900 in parts that are assembled and backed by a warranty. It should work quite well in its stock configuration. If you feel the need to upgrade this machine, you have quite a few options. My first priority would be add a second 8GB stick of RAM to get up to 16GB and be in dual channel mode. Next, I would add a 1TB SATA SSD as a storage drive so you can have more games installed. I would probably just stop there. You do have the option to upgrade the GPU to something like a GTX 1660 Super, a GTX 1660 Ti, an RTX 2060, or even an RTX 3060. The 400 watt 80 plus platinum power supply has enough power to drive that and also it has one 8 pin PCIe power connector that's going to let you support quite a few different GPUs. You just want to make sure that they are small enough physically to fit in the case. Really? You have a lot to say. This is Glenn Berry with Dr. DMB LLC and I want to thank you for watching this video. If you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up button. If you have any questions, please leave a comment. And finally, if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe because that really helps the channel out.